How did you like the movie Oppenheimer? I just saw it actually. Uh, I did. I did really like it. I did really enjoy it. Um, and I, th I think I'd say this to. I think I'd say this to anyone who's involved in it. I probably could have cut 40 minutes out of that movie, and I think I would have liked it even more. But I understand, and it definitely feels like a Christopher Nolan sort of style now to to really go into you know some of the minutia and some of these. I, I didn't. I know it's based on existing material. It's based on a book. I haven't read the book, so I don't know how true it is to it. But uh, but I liked it a lot. Uh, I was a little had some trepidation about seeing it because both of my grandfathers worked on the atomic bomb project, and because of that, uh, I wasn't exactly sure exactly how I was going to feel. But uh, no, I thought they did a great job. Did either of your grandfathers tell you about this, or maybe you didn't interact with them, or I don't know? No, my, my paternal grandfather actually died when my father was 15 of cancer, and uh, he was one mile from ground zero at the first Trinity test. So he was there with a few other people and uh, uh, was out in the desert the very next day, you know, uh, picking out sand that had fused and turned into a new material. You know, it's, uh, it, it's not surprising that he died of cancer. My maternal grandfather, he died in the 70s, and I did get to meet him, but I was very young at the time. I was, I was still a small child, and I don't have too many memories of my maternal grandfather. He also died of cancer, so. And did you have any uh, relics or you know, letters or things like that? Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a letter from Oppenheimer to my, uh, my paternal grandfather, and it was sort of a treasured document, actually, in, the, in my grandmother's home growing up, and so I got to see the letter and stuff. It was, a, it was basically a letter of thanks for all the contributions to the project. So did you have reservations going to see it, you said, because of this, or just the timing, it's a three-hour movie? Yeah, I, I think that I had a little bit of psychological trauma, just, you know, not really growing up with grandfathers, uh, because uh, be, I, I think, you know, even though they just didn't know very much about radiation and radiation exposure back then, and the cumulative effects of uh, radiation poisoning, back in the era of the uh, atomic bomb, the atomic project, the Trinity project, uh, Los Alamos, all of that stuff, it was, uh, it was very, very new. And they thought they knew a lot more about it than they did. So uh, I guess I have some feelings that ultimately that work probably led to their deaths. And so I have some, some feelings about that, yeah, so. What can you teach us about the cinematography of Christopher Nolan movies? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Well, I think it kind of depends on which era you're talking about because he has very distinctive styles that sort of span different years. Talking about like, you know, the following and Memento, it's, uh, it definitely has a bit more of an indie and gritty, you know, and granted some of that has to do with resources. And then uh, really, really uh, big shifts to slick and glossy IMAX and really incredible uh, incredible talent that he was working with uh, behind the camera from probably the eras of like, you know, Inception. Uh, it, it like the, the budgets have just gotten so huge. He's one of the, you know, singular filmmakers of, uh, of his generation where he kind of gets whatever he wants technically and can command, uh, can command, uh, an unlimited, it seemingly amount of resources. When it comes to, I know that I, I know that there for a fact that he is sometimes uh, very specific about cutting down some of those resources to be able to do other things. But because he gets to start off with IMAX and he gets to start off with a lot of the technology that other filmmakers only dream about, um, he can do amazing things. He can he can work with this canvas that most people can't even dream of. What is documentary style lighting? Ah, oh, documentary style lighting. Documentary style lighting generally is not the same as narrative lighting. So when you're talking about a narrative production, quite often lights are set up very specifically for a shot or maybe for a specific or an area. Um, when you're talking about documentary style lighting, you're usually giving all of the people who are the subject of your documentary free reign to move. You're not boxing them or limiting them. You're not rehearsing blocking quite often with documentary style lighting. So it really is sort of a fundamental shift between a very controlled, very uh, aesthetic style of narrative filmmaking and a, I want to say, I don't want to say loosey-goosey. It's not loosey-goosey, but it is, uh, it provides the subjects much more freedom. And if they might, if they move into shadow, they might move into shadow. 
in narrative filmmaking, there's, it's almost always very intentional. There's an intention if someone moves in a the shadow, there's an intention if someone's in the light, there's an intention if someone is, you know, if there's diffracted light or reflected light or anything else that's going on. So it's different with documentary. Have you ever been on a Christopher Nolan set? No, uh, I've never been on a Christopher Nolan set, but um, uh, one of his camera operators, Michael Fitzmaurice, is a client of my, mine, my company, Hot Rod Cameras. Uh, he worked a lot on The Dark Knight. He's worked on other Christopher Nolan movies. And uh, we've gotten to hear some great stories uh, you know, from, from Michael on our podcast where he, you know, he talks about some of the work that he's done. So, so yeah, we have quite a few connections, but, uh, but he's probably the one I would know, know most responsible for the, the work, except, except for maybe Wally Pfister. Wally Pfister, I've spoken to for hours about his work with, uh, with Christopher Nolan. Was Oppenheimer your favorite uh, Nolan film? Hmm, it's a good question. No, probably not my favorite. I do really like The Prestige, but um, and I know that's probably a less popular choice, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know, that might be The Prestige. How would you compare and contrast Christopher Nolan versus David Fincher, their styles? Yeah, very different styles. Um, David Fincher is very exacting and very controlling, and uh, I know he does a lot of takes. Uh, I, I've spoken with Claudio Miranda uh, uh, about working with David Fincher quite a bit, and I have some insights in his process. I've met David Fincher a few times uh, in, over the courses of different projects he was working on back in the era of Benjamin Button, and then also again with Gone Girl, and we talked about cameras and camera technology. Uh, David Fincher uh, has very, very clear goals clear thoughts about how it is he wants to achieve it. And uh, I believe that when David Fincher is deciding about the, the look for a project, he wants collaborators that are absolutely in his same sort of mindset about technology and his same sort of mindset about what he wants to achieve. He suffers no fools. And uh, I get the impression that Christopher Nolan is uh, very much a collaboration, and he wants uh, other people to come to the table and bring what they're good at, and to bring their own uh, insights, and to try to find ways to get the absolute best technology and the best quality out of out of the team. So I would say it's it's definitely sort of maybe a a hard driving versus a more collaborated collaborative. But you know this is me speaking you know third hand. I was not there. I, I have to you know, get the information from somebody else.